So thank you very much for inviting me to TEDx Malmo. It is a real pleasure to be here. So, is the trend towards climate change irreversible? Well, if you look at the numbers right now, we can see that we are now emitting more CO2 gases than ever before. And we are roughly running 80% of our global economy still on fossil fuels. This is despite all the efforts we've been making in the past decade. And it is roughly the same share that it was a decade ago. But even more concerning is that we are now quickly approaching something called the climate tipping points, where some kind of process is just causing global warming to accelerate even further, like warming oceans, which causes the ice, ice sheet to melt, which then causes the oceans to absorb more heat, which cause even further melting of, of the sea ice. And the same thing is going on in the tundra, where the melting permafrost is just releasing gases. And then these gases is just increasing the warmth of the planet, increasing the the uh, gases being emitted and so forth, and this sort of ever-expanding loop of, of climate change. So this isn't really a promising story, but I think it's a brighter side to the story that has seldom been, been told, and one of the most important developments in, in the past few years that has been a bit overlooked. Because the question is that, although we do have these climate tipping points which cause everything to go for the worse, could it also be that there might be some tipping points that is working in our favor to actually combat climate change. Where even though we don't really know that we're there yet, we can see that from this point in time, we can see that we're now going in the right direction, it is irreversible, and we'll actually get where we want to be. Well, I'll claim today that such a point exists. And I will furthermore claim that we're now actually passing this, this point right now as we speak. And the question is then how we, we can use this to our, our, our advantage. And I also believe that due to this tipping point, we will actually win the, the, the fight against climate change. So, it all comes down to, to economics. A few years ago, the arguments went something like, like this. We need to decarbonize our economy, because what we're doing right now is actually destroying our Earth habitat. So what we need to do now? Well, we need to build out re renewables. However, Renewables are a bit more expensive than conventional, so if we do this, we'll do that on the expense of our general well-being. And for poor countries, this isn't really perhaps an, an attractive option, because they have other needs, of course. And for more, more advanced countries, it might also mean that you lose in competitiveness or something else. Now, for long, this was exactly the case, but then something tiny but very significant happened. Germany the birthplace of Einstein and H.P. Baxter. They decided more than a decade ago that they didn't want anything to do with, with global warming. They were going to decarbonize. And one of the ways they were going to, to do that was to harness the, the sun. There were more sunshine flowing in on Germany every year that then, I mean, it was hundredfolds or thousandfold more than they actually needed on a yearly basis. The only problem was that harnessing power from the sun was roughly three or four times more expensive than by, by doing it by the conventional way, by coal plants or gas, gas plants. So in order for, to do this, they needed subsidies. So they launched heavy subsidies to be able to build out this, this new, new power. But what then happened is that when they started to build th this out, production volumes went up. When production volumes went up, the prices came down. And since the price came down, it meant that they could increase the build-out targets even further. And then other countries saw this, of course. They saw the falling prices on solar panels and figured, that, oh, maybe this is something we, we should also do. So they also launched programs of their own to build out solar power. And then prices were being reduced, and then even more countries joined the fray, up until to a point where solar power was more inexpensive than the conventionals, and thus didn't need subsidies any, any longer. What they invoked here is something called the learning effect, or the learning curve, which is something that is quite common in any technology really. So you can see that in computer and many things else. And that is when you double the amount of produced something, the, there is a significant cost reduction in the per unit cost. So for solar panels, it means that if you would double your solar capacity being produced, the cost of the solar panels actually decreased by 20%. And since the amount of solar panel being produced was actually hundredfold or something like that, the price just plummeted. An interesting part is that at almost the same time, the exact same thing happened with wind energy. There we also have pioneers like Denmark, Germany, the UK and other countries really wanted to push for, for climate solutions. 
and this enabled the companies to then invest in R&D, innovation and scale. So prices also came down quite a lot. And the effect of this was just staggering. So from 2009 to 2019, the cost of solar produced energy was reduced by 89%, costing only a tenth of what it did only a decade ago. And being instead of just being three or four times more expensive than conventional, it now costed only a fraction. And the same thing ha happened for onshore wind. So the prices for onshore wind over a decade was reduced by 70%, now costing less than half of, of what, it, what it would cost for producing it from conventionals. Offshore wind, where, where is when you put onshore wind turbines out into the water, was a bit, little bit later into the game. But also there, prices were reduced by 65% over five years. And this is remarkable. And this effect in itself, if you combine these three, three te technologies, it's now in 90% of all the countries on, on the globe, renewable are now the cheapest source of new energy that can be built. And this is a complete game changer, right? Because back in the days, we needed subsidies to be able to build this out. Now, rather, this is the most, this is the cheapest source you can actually build, which means that in order to get it built, you just need to remove barriers. And instead of the market forces working against you, you now have them as an ally working for you in the fight against climate change. And to the point, last year in 2019, over 70% of all the new capacity being deployed across the globe was actually renewable capacity. And this was up from a mere pittance just a decade ago. And the story doesn't really end, end there. So if you believe the forecast, you can, you can see that solar and wind is going to further be reduced in price since volumes is going, going up by roughly 50 or 60% in the coming, coming decades. So costing even less than it than does today. But then you would of course say, well, that is all good. Solar and wind is good, but you cannot possibly run and hold any system on solar and wind, right? What about when the wind isn't blowing or the sun isn't shining? Well, that would be true if it weren't the case that we also had storage and power tracks and grids. Grids doesn't really need that much explanation, but you can send the, um, the power to where it's needed through our, our, our power grids. Storage, in terms of batteries, that is just when you store the energy produced from, for instance, solar panels uh, during the day and then use it during, during the night. And that is all, all good for short time intervals. But if you want to store energy longer, uh, or if you want to do international shipping, airplanes, or even decarbonize industry, batteries won't do you much, much good. But then to the rescue comes something called power to X or power to gas. And this is quite a simple concept, really. And it's that power is something you need to just use instantaneously, right? But if you can store this in some other format, in, in the form of chemical energy, then you have to store it for a, for a long time. And in power to X, what you essentially do is that you take your power and you put it down into water, just just no water, H2O. And this extra energy actually splits the water um, molecule H2O into O's, oxygen, which you just release or breathe, and then H2. And this H2, this hydrogen, that can then be used to decarbonize industry. You can use it for shipping or if you combine this with CO2, which we have in abundance, then you can actually produce any organic molecule you want. So you can produce ammonia, methane, or any, anything else really that you can now produce from fossil fuels. But the technicality isn't really the point. The point is that by these two solutions, we now have the tools needed to completely alter the energy e equation. Now we can use the intermittency of solar and wind and actually even that out to, to get the energy when we need it and how much we need of it. The trouble is, of course, that this is currently a bit expensive, so it can't really be driven by, by market force alone. But if we do increase the build out our targets, if we really incentivize this and, and get up, up to scale, the same thing can happen for power to X like it did for solar and wind. And it can actually re reach this renewable tipping point to be able to be sustained on its on its own, own legs. The same thing we're already seeing now happen with, with electric vehicles, right? A couple of years ago, this was way too expensive for most, for most people. But now, due to the increased scale and so on, the total cost of ownership for many electric vehicles are now roughly the same, or in the future will be even lower than the conventional alternative, because the renewable tipping point has been, been reached. Now, it is very difficult to forecast the future, right? But by studying the past, we can really get, get some guidance on, on where we are now. And what we see is that 
it isn't really inevitable where we are now. We can make the choices, we can choose the future we want, we can create the future we want. And if we would be brave and do like, like Germany did, for instance, saying that this is the renewable future we want, we can choose a certain path. We cannot really predict the future, that is very, very hard. But by studying the past, we can see that where we are right now isn't really inevitable. We choose to get where we are now. We can also choose and create the future we want. So if we did like Germany did, and just choose a, a renewable path forward, we can reach these renewable tipping points for any technology we, we want to, to actually make this self-sustaining. Self there are multiple other problems with renewables, such as where should we, should we put them? What about the sustainable supply chains and so on? But I believe that all of these problems can be solved, but the major battle has now been, been, been won because we are beyond the point where this is actually the cheapest option we can, we can utilize. And we can also afford it. So the International Energy Agency, IRENA, sorry, the Renewable International Energy Agency, IRENA, they're looking at the full cost of decarbonizing the global energy system in the coming 30 years. And the numbers that they, they come up with was 130 trillion US dollars. 130 trillion US dollars. Now, that is deep decarbonization. So that is airplanes, steel making, power, cats and dogs, everything. And it sounds like a big number, but if you really dig down to it, you see that during this time period, because this is a lot of years, and it's also a lot of countries and regions, it's only roughly about a percentage of our global G GDP. And currently, we are putting, a lot, most countries are putting a lot more than that than just tobacco, alcohol, and makeup. And not saying that it's an e eater off and that we shouldn't enjoy ourselves or paint our faces, just that if we choose to do this, we can really afford it. Also, since this is the cheaper option than going the conventional route, this would actually be more affordable for us to do. And this isn't even taking into account the huge cost of cataclysmic climate change. The good part is that a lot of countries have and regions have actually un uh, understood this. So the EU, for instance, they have a net zero target for 2050. And they plan to build out a huge amount of offshore wind, onshore wind, solar, storage, and now also lately power to, to X and power to gas to really bundle this together into a coherent form. South Korea and Japan, just this autumn, also decided that they will go for net zero in 2050. China, same goal for 2060. The world's largest emitter of CO2, China, going for 2060 carbon neut neutrality. And then just last week, there was another game changer, and that was Denmark. Denmark has been a pioneer in this field for a, a long time. But actually after Brexit, they, they would be the largest producer of oil and gas in the entire EU. And they decided last week that even though they have a lot of oil and gas in, in the ground, they will not allow any more grants for exploring this on their continental shelf. Imagine that for a minute. So there's a country who has oil and gas in the ground, but due to climate change, they decided that this is not the way to go. We would not do this. We go on the renewable path instead. That is a game changer. That is a landmark. And that is something that a lot of other brave countries could also f follow. But I think that a big reason for them actually doing this is also this underlying cost curve. So why would you do anything else than net zero since this is, is the cheapest option? However, there are still challenges and this is not a call for, for being passive, rather, rather the opposite. This is a call for hope and if we do the right thing we can really reach where we want to go. We'll still need spearheading countries, companies, cities and people who are brave enough to do the right thing and choose the path we, we really want. And think about it. We will be the generation, no, sorry, we get to be the generation who maybe reverses climate change. We can be the generation who actually sees the uh, CO2 emission go down from, from, from its peak and down, down to a sustainable level. We can be the generation who has more trees on the ground and more fish in the ocean, clean up the plastic waste, and arguably be the first generation in 300 years who actually leaves the planet in a better shape to our children than how we got it from our, our, our parents. Now that is a huge opportunity. And I'll quote Greta Thunberg who said that, act like our house is on fire, because our house is on fire. I fully agree with her, but I also believe that now we've found ourselves a really good water hose. And I think that we should use this the best way we can, because if we reach these renewable tipping points, we are really making a huge change here. And that is the opportunity for a better tomorrow. So please join us in this struggle, and I'm sure that we'll get there. Thanks.